Hello, general psychology students. So the purpose of this short video is to cover the second section of chapter two biopsychology, the section on cells of the nervous system. So in the last video, I talked about the first section of chapter three, which was on human genetics. And we talked about the difference between a genotype and a phenotype. We talked about identical twins or monozygotic twins and compared them with dizygotic twins or fraternal twins. And we talked about how important twins are to the study of psychology because it helps us to differentiate or maybe account for um, what kinds of behaviors are due to genetics versus what kinds of behaviors are due to the environment. And of course, most psychologists, we believe that there's an interaction between both and they're both very important. But the study of twins, especially identical twins, helps us to really um, identify how much of a behavior or a trait is due to genetics. Um, one interesting finding that I didn't talk about in the last video has to do with the happiness literature. And so what some researchers have done is they gave a happiness scale to um, uh, people who are identical twins, people who are fraternal twins, regular siblings, and even to strangers. And they look at the correlation, remember the correlation from the last chapter, chapter two, correlation, the extent to which two variables co-relate together, how they relate together. There's a much stronger positive correlation between life satisfaction or happiness between twins who are identical than there is between fraternal twins, regular siblings, and strangers. And this sort of gives us the idea that some of your life satisfaction, some of your um, happiness level is due to genetics. When researchers delved into the whole field more, they, um, many have uh, theorized that up to 50% of our happiness is actually due to our genetic makeup. Um, when you think of Winnie the Pooh, I don't know if your parents read that to you. I know it was read to me and I read it to my kids. Um, characters like Tigger, who's always excited and has lots of energy, and characters like Eeyore, who's just always kind of sad, sort of lets us believe that there's a temperament or uh, predisposition perhaps for some people to be more happy than others. And there is some data that definitely supports that. Um, about 10% of happiness is due to life situation, how much money you have, whether you're married and you want to be married, whether you have a kid and you want to have a kid, that kind of thing. Most of us believe that our life situation has a huge impact on our happiness, but really only 10%. And about 40% of our happiness is affected by intentional activities, habits, ways of thought that we have. And I'll be talking about um, some of these intentional activities throughout the year, throughout the semester, that will increase your happiness level. So, all right, well, let's now get to the second part of our chapter three, biopsychology. And this section is on the cells of the neurosystem, of the neuro nervous system, sorry, the cells of the nervous system. So what we're talking about here is the brain. So this, the rest of the chapter is going to basically talk uh, or have a lot to do with the brain. We want to understand the brain because the brain it, um, houses so much of what's going on that we study in psychology uh, behavior. And we're going to start with the smallest and then go to the biggest parts of the brain. And so we're going to start talking about neurons. So we have billions of neurons in our bodies. A lot of them um, are in our brain. They are very, 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 very small. Um, and uh, uh, they, they allow, the neurons allow our brain to communicate with our bodies, the rest of our body, our, the rest of our body to communicate with our brains and different parts of our brain to communicate with other parts of our brain. They're very, very important. And um, the purpose of this video is for you to be able to see how they communicate with one another. And so I'm gonna do a share screen so we can go to the PowerPoint slides from chapter three. And so the PowerPoint slide that we have here is a neuron. This is what a neuron looks like or what it can look like. So it's important to me that you understand the parts of the neuron, okay? Now, I don't need you to understand it where on the exam you're gonna be given this with blank lines and you have to fill out what they are. Remember, it's a multiple choice exam. But I do need you to know the basic parts of a neuron. So you can see most neurons have these tree-like branches on the end. And these tree-like branches we call dendrites. So um, not all neurons, but most neurons will have these dendrites. So the tree-like branches 
the very beginning are called dendrites. And then of course we have the cell body, the soma, and the cell membrane, like all cells, it's gonna be around. Then this next structure here is called the axon. So the axon is um, um, almost like a, 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 a tube that goes down the neuron. In the, for the neurons in our brain, the axon is relatively short, for, um, but for neurons that are like communicating to our legs and such, such the axons are much longer. Now on the axon are these things that we call the myelin sheath. They're sort of like bubble wrap. And now not all neurons have the myelin sheath, have the bubble wrap. In fact, the neurons that are in your digestive system do not. But most of our neurons will have this myelin sheath. Um, healthy people, neurons that are real healthy are gonna have a thick myelin sheath. The thicker the myelin sheath, the faster that neuron can communicate information. If the myelin sheath starts to degrade, um, that, um, uh, that causes all kinds of problems in our neurons communicating with one another. So people with muscular dystrophy will have myelin sheaths that have holes in it or are not as thick. And you can see by the way they walk, they have issues with balance, issues with their, um, uh, their brain being able to communicate well with their body. So the myelin sheath is like the bubble wrap that's on the axon and the the thicker the myelin sheath, the faster the um, neuron can communicate with the next neuron. And at the very end of the neuron are these terminal buttons. And so the terminal buttons actually have in them these little vesicles, these little vessels that hold neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are chemicals. Um, and when neurons communicate with one another, we call it an electrochemical process. We call it electrical because there's actually an electrical current that lets that um, makes the uh, neuron fire. But if it fires, then out of these terminal buttons will come some neurotransmitter. And the neurotransmitter will float between this neuron and the next neuron that's laying right after it. And of course, you can sort of see them in this faded yellow. This faded yellow are the dendrites of the next neuron. And so the neurotransmitter sort of is in that synapse, that space between the terminal buttons of your first neuron and the dendrites of the second neuron. And in that synapse, in that space, out um, sort of oozes the neurotransmitter, these chemicals. And if the chemical reaches the, the dendrites of the next neuron, and if on those dendrites there's um, a receptor that can accept that neurotransmitter, then the, neuro, then the neurotransmitter will be accepted by the next neuron. If enough of that neurotransmitter, um, um, uh, and it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, if enough of it is into that next neuron, then if it meets a threshold, then that neuron will fire and it'll go, um, the message will go down the axon very fast if the myelin sheath is thick, go down to the next neuron's terminal buttons and causing its um, neurotransmitter to float or ooze into that synapse and try to connect to the next um, uh, neuron, okay? So I'd like us, I'm gonna show you just a real very short um, video clip that I think kind of does a good job um, of explaining it. They call it two minutes, uh, two minute neuroscience, I think it's called. I think you'll enjoy this. Here we go. So remember this presynaptic neuron, that's the, um, 
that's the terminal buttons is where we are in that. The postsynaptic neuron, that's the dendrites of where we are that. So I'm trying to kind of put this in, into perspective of where we are. Okay, I hope you found that helpful. Okay. So, so I hope you understand now from, um, from that how one neuron then talks to the next neuron, communicates with the next neuron, and they keep going. They use, let me go back to the PowerPoint slides. Um, they're going to use as they do this, what we call the all or none principle. I have to get to this slide, Joe, sorry. The all or none, this is sort of what we were talking about just a minute ago. It's going to use what's called the all or none principle, which means that if enough of the neurotransmitter is accepted by that, uh, the second neuron, that receptor neuron, enough uh, neurotransmitter that excites it, then it will fire. If not enough is there, then it won't fire. So it's very much like a bullet. If you, it's not like if you press, I'm sorry, a gun. If you press the lever a little bit, then um, it'll the bullet will go out a little bit. Or if you press it really hard, then it will. Go, it's all or none. Like the lever, press, then the bullet goes or it doesn't go. And how much effort you put on pressing the lever on a gun doesn't affect the speed of the bullet going out. It's very similar with the neurons communicating with one another. If enough of the neurotransmitter is there to fire the neuron, then the neuron fires. If it doesn't have enough, then it won't fire. It's an all or none principle is what we call it. Okay. And so that um, if the neuron is seen as resting when there's no neural impulse there at all, there, it's not being activated in any way. But if enough of that neuro neurotransmitter is there, the excitatory part, if it passes a threshold, then it will reach its action potential and it will fire. And after it fires, then it goes back to its resting state. And it actually hyperpolarizes a little bit and then goes back to its resting state. And then it's ready to be fired again. Okay. Um, we already talked about this, how reuptake is if the neurotransmitter is um, uh, in this is still in the synapse, it may go back to the initial um, uh, terminal buttons, go back into that first neuron if it hasn't been um, taken up by the second one. Okay, now the next thing that I want to talk about, um, I'm going to stop the share, are the neurotransmitters. So if you go to page 85 of your textbook, um, and I know most of you are doing this online, it has a really nice table that talks about the neurotransmitters. And I don't need you to memorize the table. It's not like you need to know every single uh, neurotransmitter, but I do want you to be a little bit familiar with them. So acetylcholine, um, ACH, enables muscle action, learning, and memory. And with Alzheimer's disease, ACH seems, uh, it seems like those uh, Neurons that have a lot of ACH neurotransmitter in their terminal buttons seem to deteriorate. And that, so we think ACH, low levels of it play a role in Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that we are gonna talk about over and over in this class because dopamine is a good feeling um, uh, um, uh, neurotransmitter. In fact, when we're rewarded, we get a little squirt of dopamine, people will often say. And so it influences movement, learning, attention, and mainly emotion. 
An oversupply, too much of dopamine has been linked to schizophrenia, but an undersupply has been linked to tremors and problems with Parkinson's disease. But you have to be careful if you take someone with Parkinson's disease and try to increase their dopamine level so that they won't have Parkinson's anymore or to get rid of some of the symptoms, you can overdo it and then they can end up with hallucinations and almost look like someone with schizophrenia. So it's very much you have to have that right amount. Another neurotransmitter that I want you to be familiar with is called serotonin. And serotonin plays a huge role in depression. We think that people, oftentimes people who suffer from depression um, have a low level of serotonin. And some antidepressants, the way that they work is by increasing either the number of um, receptor sites that will accept serotonin or increase the amount of serotonin that's available in the terminal buttons in those vesicles um, to go out. Serotonin affects mood. It also affects hunger, sleep, and arousal. And if you think of someone who's depressed, oftentimes they have very low levels of arousal. Oftentimes they'll either sleep too much or not enough. And oftentimes they have no appetite whatsoever. So you can see how that serotonin is affecting all of those things. There's also uh, norepinephrine, glutamine, GABA. There are a bunch of neurotransmitters, but dopamine and serotonin are the two that I'll be talking about throughout the semester. Okay, well, that ends this um, review of the second section of chapter three that focuses on the cells of the nervous system. Um, the next um, video will be about the nervous system.